Funding for Willie the Lion has been provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through the Eastern Educational Network Program Fund, the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, and the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, a partner agency of the National Endowment for the Arts. The lion was a myth, actually, that you saw come alive. The lion was one of the greatest influences on uh, the piano players of that era. Even James P. was influenced by him. And, and in many years later, even uh, the great Art Tatum, who was definitely the greatest. Between 1920 and 1940, few pianists achieved the mythological status of Willie the Lion Smith. Harlem was the lion's den, and there he lay in wait for other pianists trying to make a name for themselves. Duke Ellington said that any cat who came in thinking he was something special had to prove it right then and there, and he usually came out lacerated by the lion. So I start to play, and I'm walking tense and, and, and doing what I thought was pretty hip for a young piano player. And uh, I was about 16 bars into the tune when this uh, elderly gentleman with a cigar and a, and a, a derby came over and said, let me try a little of that, son. I looked at him, yeah, sure. So I get up, and this guy sat out. I had never in my life heard a left hand like this. And he was awesome. The left hand, he was playing octaves and, and, and a chord, then he played tenth and a chord. He was doing. I said, wow, you know, I, 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 my mouth fell open. It was Willie Lyon Smith. They called the early jazz pianists ticklers and Willie the Lion Smith was a tickler's tickler. He was also a showman, a composer of over 100 songs, a war hero, a cantor in a Harlem synagogue, and a raconteur. He helped to create the piano style known as stride, but in the words of Duke Ellington, he was beyond category. He, like I, hated categories. And he was a musician. A musician plays music, and other people name it. about 19, I just got to New York, and I was waiting for a local 802 car. So I was walking around Harlem looking for a place to play, just to keep my traps up. So I had my case with me, horn, alto and alto, alto and clarinet. And I turned around a corner, I think it was 134th Street, and there was a little canopy. And I heard this piano coming out. And it was quite different from anything I'd ever heard. I stopped listening, listening. Fascinating. But wherever the hell it was playing that piano in there, the son of a bitch had to be some kind of a real wild man. So I stood there and waited. And uh, after a while, a guy came out. And I said, uh, who's that piano player? He's a bitch in there. So I said, you're looking at him. So I said, you're the guy who played that piano? So he said, yeah. So we kept talking a little bit. And he said, he's got a horn there? I said, that's right. She said, what you doing? I said, I want to come down and play a little bit. Can I join you? She said, sure, come on in. So I walked in. It was a very strange experience. I was the only white guy in the place. Willie was my open sesame. He took me all over Harlem. He was known. He was known all over the place. And it was like being a protege. For some young jazz musicians, like Artie Shaw, Duke Ellington, Thelonious Monk, and Billy Taylor, the Lion was a generous teacher. But he could be tough on pretenders. With his trademark derby, a smoldering cigar, and icy stare, he had a knack for flustering rivals. Duke Ellington said the lion was a gladiator at heart. I had a habit like a fighter has. It's called psychology. When a guy is playing as hard as I walk up and say, get away from that piano, man. And say it like you mean it, or grab his arms and get away from there. The lion was such a, 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 a harsh teacher you know, I mean, he'd walk up to people while they were playing and say, something wrong with your hand there, your left hand? And, what, are you crippled? 
he could and might very well uh, decapitate you verbally or even freeze on you. He used to talk about Sometimes, you know, when a cat bugs me, I put the Jimmy Freeze on him. That's what we do. Sometimes there was one turkey, you know, he had an accent like Groucho Marx, like a Brooklynite. A Brooklynite. Yeah, he was a piece of work. called Goshen, New York, 1897, 25th day of November. Name, William Henry Joseph Bonaparte Vitalis. What a name. Takes in French and Jewish. My mother played the organ. My grandmother played the organ and the guitar. That's where I take the music from. And I heard it first as a little boy in Newark, New Jersey. By the lion's own account, musical sounds were like a magnet that was constantly pulling him toward the source. And in turn of the century Newark, there were many sources. Ragtime and church hymns, marching bands, Tin Pan Alley hits, Yiddish songs, Victorian parlor melodies and European operettas. The hybrid sounds of Newark really absorbed them all. Newark in those early years in the 20th century, right into the 30s, uh, was known as a very important place for, you know, jazz piano players, stride piano players, uh, boogie woogie piano players, blues piano players to, to develop. Newark was also known as, as a tickler's town, tickler being, you know, the word for a piano player. The city was predominantly German, with a patchwork of ethnic neighborhoods. German, Irish, Jewish, Greek, Chinese, and a small but rapidly growing black population, mostly in the old Third Ward, on the fringes of the red light district. Young Willie, whose actual birth date was 1894, was about seven years old when he arrived in Newark. He described his early years in his memoir, Music on My Mind. We lived on the edge of the Tenderloin district known around the world as the coast. My stepfather put us into a four-room house with an attic at 76 Academy Street, where the rent was only $12 a month. His mother was a devout Baptist who played the organ in church and tried to steer her son to sacred music. I used to hear my mother play something as a hymn, and I used to take it and play it in ragtime, we call it then. Some folks call it gut bucket. Some folks call it in the alley. Some folks call it lowdown, as you feel it. I used to go in a saloon and dance, sing and play, and then pass my hat around. And I'd come home and bring the money. So then my mother said, well, if that's what you want to do, I'm with you. He spoke about the Baptist Church and how much their music meant to him and the call and response pattern between the reverend and the people in the congregation and the choir. And I was always kind of thrilled about the way the Baptist Sang because they seemed to give vent to their feeling. Two things attracted me in my early boyhood and still does between the Baptist colored people and the Jewish people. The lion was immersed in the Judaic faith. He considered himself, he took his father's faith. His father, Frank Bertolov, was a Jew. I used to carry clothes and every day I'd go on Shabbos to take care. Uh, Take the clothes which my mother used to wash for 25 cents a dozen. I had to carry them 10 blocks in Newark, New Jersey. The rabbi would be there on Shabbos, which is Saturday, the weekend, and he would give the Jewish kids a lesson. So I used to recite. He did speak a little Yiddish. And I asked him how that came out. He said, well, he believed in that religion. He didn't know I was Jewish. I didn't tell him that. I was very surprised because his card was in Yiddish characters. The only people who learned how to make pig's feet and pickle them up so they could sell them fast was the Jewish people. So now we'd go around, we'd go around later in the evening and say, knock a bissel, knock, knock, knock. Mistake? <laughs> <laughs> I'm getting lost here, slowly but surely. <laughs> Willie not only celebrated his bar mitzvah at age 13, 
but in later years he became the cantor of a synagogue in Harlem. Knock, knock, knock. Give us a stick up. Newark's Tenderloin was known as the coast, the only part of town where a young black entertainer could get a start. That's where Willie learned the ragtime favorites, in the saloons, the buffet flats, and brothels. This is one I remembered when I was 10 years old. The name was Don't You Hit That Lady Dressed in Green. And this is how they used to play it. And this is the type of music they played at that time. They called it ragtime. Oh, will you dance with me? I always... <laughs> The point about ragtime was that it was syncopated. It was a uh, usually a steady 2-4 rhythm in the left hand and all sorts of uh, fooling around on the right hand against the beat. Willie got his first steady gig playing piano at Bill Buss's saloon for a dollar a day in tips. Then he moved up to Randall's, a dance hall in Ratskeller. The cakewalk had inspired new dance crazes, the two-step, the turkey trot, and the grizzly bear and the Ticklers had to provide the musical accompaniment. Willie Smith now had several rivals to watch out for, as well as those who dropped in from out of town. In 1913, a short but powerfully built pool chart by the name of Charles Lucky of Roberts showed up at Randall's on the coast. Lucky Roberts had been an acrobat and child actor in traveling productions of Uncle Tom's Cabin. His massive hands could stretch a 14th on the keyboard. Willie admired his style. Robert's signature piece, Pork and Beans, became one of the tests for serious pianists. In the fall of 1914, Willie met James Price Johnson from New Brunswick, New Jersey, who became his closest friend. Willie wrote about James P. with obvious affection. He was born under the mixed-up sign of Aquarius, he was always a sincere guy, easily hurt, kind of naive and easygoing. I used to sort of watch after him, so naturally I nicknamed him The Brute. Willie and James P. were soon exchanging ideas and tricks of the trade. Willie adopted one of his pal's display pieces, Carolina Shout, and continued to perform it for the rest of his life. Jimmy was a guy very timid, but a great artist. He liked the alleys. He was a real alley cat. I got his philosophy. He always liked to kind of look down on the, and kind of go where the guys wasn't doing so well. What do we call it now, the ghettos? James P. felt the same admiration for Willie. Willie Smith was one of the sharpest ticklers I ever met, and I met most of them. He was a fine dresser, very careful about the cut of his clothes, and a fine dancer, too, in addition to his great playing. When Willie Smith walked into a place, his every move was a picture. He was always a fighter, and he fought a lot of my battles over the years. I remember the first thing he ever said to me when I met him and played after him on the coast over in Newark. He said, well, you might be able to play better than I can, but I bet I can beat you fighting. In those times when you were a personality, there, uh, you could always tell one because he wore a diamond stick pin. It wasn't a make-believe, it was a diamond stick pin. Let's say $500. And a diamond in the tooth. And that's what Jelly Roll had when I first saw him. Willie and his pals were intoxicated with the glamorous lifestyle of the Ticklers. Sporting men with lots of girlfriends. Musical gladiators whose sharp playing and sharp clothes were weapons for cutting up the competition. He came out of a tradition in which pianists were entertainers and in which they played by themselves. Possibly they might be accompanying singers, but they were unencumbered by uh, rhythm sections or, or bands. They were, they were the featured act, and they were the reason people showed up for many of those clubs. Well, Art, this reminds me of uh, what we used to call it in Harlem, in the alley. <laughs> Everything is copacetic. I got the $20 gold piece on. A lot of 20-year men here. <laughs> Every time I look at you, it makes me think. When Willie sat down to the piano, he was really going to show you how, how it should be done. And um, 
I also remember him going bong like that. It would be the tonic note. He'd hit it very hard, and then he'd go into some beautiful original harmonic thing. In those days, every pianist had his own signature piece or signature chord or signature riff. He wouldn't play it immediately. He'd start off softly and play maybe a ballad of the day. And then, without any warning, he'd break into some fast stride thing to show everybody how great he was. It was entertaining. I mean, it was not only the music, but it was his persona that was a, such a grabber. According to Willie, all the good pianists were ladies' men. The women, he wrote, always wondered if the piano man was as good in bed as he was at the keyboard. During the summers before World War I, serious piano players from all over the East converged on Atlantic City. While the white folks frolicked along the boardwalk, the blacks who lived and worked in town found their amusement 20 blocks west in a neighborhood known as The Line. In places like the Boathouse, the Bucket of Blood and Kelly's, competition at the keyboard was fierce. There's a guy named Kitchen Tom. Atlantic City was a Creole, or Jelly Roll, he was a Creole. Myself, we're about three of the guys who played in sporting houses on the line. You've got to be a shopper. You see and don't see. If they like you, they allow a, a guy, one girl a week, to be picked out. And they didn't allow too many fellas to set in, but when a guy was going to take your job, if you didn't know it real good, he, he would be watching you. At Kelly's, Willie was watching an older guy from Baltimore named Uby Blake, who had to defend his chair from the likes of Willie, James P. Johnson, and Lucky Roberts. In 1915, when Uby Blake moved on to New York, Willie took his place. He said to me very often, it was uh, better to uh, not go to the bathroom and leave yourself on the piano stool than, than to get up and risk having someone else come in and bump you. If, if, if you had competitors in, in those days, everybody did. He talked about them as if, like Macy's versus Gimbel's. It was a real uh, battle. That's what they liked. Ragtime means the guy that don't know the keyboard. He just rags off a few riffles what comes to him. Now, the difference between ragtime, piano playing, and a pianist is a pianist is supposed to know all the progressions, how to move around, move both hands. As pianists like Willie Smith, James P. Johnson, and U.B. Blake transformed ragtime into a new musical style, they grew to resent the assumption that all black players were ragtimers. Many people see the relationship of ragtime and stride piano and in a general way consider the two things as a, as a unit. I'm not sure that that's the way Willie the Lion saw it at all. Now, uh, most of those pianists uh, in the uh, stride period learned to play in every key. They learned to play whatever they could do in any tempo, so they mastered the instrument. The piano in their hands was an orchestra. You heard everything you needed to hear. This is the style of piano they played when they didn't have good left hands. <laughs> called a corn. Some people think it's piano, but that's pure corn. It means I don't know how to play. There was always this steady left hand rhythm, and Scott Joplin would do. The stride pianists, uh, like Willie the Lion or James P. Johnson, extended the bass. They had a lot more going on. Uh, they would play, for example, the same piece left hand which is probably the origin of uh, the term striding it moves it strides really from up in that kind of fashion ragtime is a pure written form of music that's similar to sati or early uh, Mozart sonata. 
there's not too much improvisation in ragtime. Stride is a jazz piano style that has a very different beat, has a much more varied left hand. And there are many different forms of what are called tension and release in stride, and there aren't that many in ragtime. Now that's what we call stride, means both hands move. They were playing, I think, what they called the finer type of music. They saw their playing as a clear evolution, something very new and more difficult, more musical, more sophisticated than ragtime, and certainly than blues. Because if I was going to put that same strain in, I'd strike it. Uh, uh, uh. There's your stride, it means real good. We had a club uh, here, here in New York called the Famous Clep Club, where all the guys were thorough musicians. In order to join it, you had to not only be a great musician, your discipline had to be 100%, your character 100%, because we played for all the rich people, the classic people. In 1910, a Broadway orchestra director named James Reese Europe formed the Clef Club, a booking agency and union for black musicians. From the cabarets to the concert halls, Europe's orchestras dominated the New York music scene and won new levels of respect and popularity for black musicians. You have to recognize that uh, the musicians that uh, were in that group all came under the influence of James Reese Europe. This was all a part of what Willie the Lion heard, and he could see around him uh, with uh, the people from the various groups that uh, uh, were put together by James Reese Europe, that there was a melodic strain that he could tap into. Willie called it beautification, the merging of light classical melodic and harmonic strains with the rhythmic pulse of stride. In this early sound film, Clef Club member Yubi Blake beautified a familiar tune. When Willie was uh, showing me music or playing, he mainly talked about how, he was, how you should beautify a piece, how you should make it refined, and you should not bang on the piano, and you should use dynamics. The classical influence it dispels the myth that these people were semi-literate or illiterate uh, bums working in bars that, and they didn't have any understanding of music outside uh, purely instinctive means of performance. These people were sophisticated and were aware of harmony and counterpoint musical structure. Yubi told me that the fellows in Jim Europe's band could read the spots on the snake's ass. They were so good at sight reading. Blake also remembered that in the Clef Club orchestras, they sometimes had to hide the music to avoid disappointing white audiences who thought that the black musicians played by ear and couldn't read music. In September 1916, Jim Europe enlisted in the U.S. Army Infantry and was ordered to organize a regimental band. On the battlefields of France, the 15th Regiment earned the nickname the Hell Fighters, and Jim Europe became the first black combat officer in World War I. Two months after Europe enlisted, Willie Smith traded his English suits for Army drab. He had recently left his wife, a white vaudeville performer who he never divorced. Willie ended up in a new segregated regiment for field artillery, the Black Devils and helped form their own regimental band. But their musical talents did not exempt them from battle duty, as Willie recalled. When they asked for volunteers to fire the French 75s, I stepped forward. The French captain in charge told us, well, I think it'll take you a month to learn the mechanisms, and then we'll shoot you up to the front. I learned that mechanism in six hours. 
They tabbed me as an A1 gunner right off the bat. I shot those 75s at the Fritzies for 49 days straight without a break or any relief. Word got back and the colonel came up and said, Smith, you're a lion with that gun. That name stuck with me ever since. Lieutenant Jim Europespan took France by storm, turning the new sounds of jazz into an international phenomenon. Returning stateside, the Hellfighters marched up Fifth Avenue to Harlem, where they received a hero's welcome. Sergeant Willie the Lion Smith was not sent home until a year after the armistice, but he entertained French audiences wherever he found a piano. On his discharge papers, they wrote, Sergeant Smith went through the war with the 92nd Division, and his conduct was excellent in battle, showing nerve, faith, and intuition. The Lion took his nerve and faith where his intuition told him to, and immediately went back to the saloon wars in Harlem, pounding the piano. According to the Lion, Leroy Wilkins Club at 135th and 5th was the oldest cabaret in Harlem, the place where all the dicties from the Negro show world, the prize fighters, and the sports people stopped in. Wilkins put the lion in charge, which meant performing seven nights a week from 9.30 until the morning. For white audiences, two events sparked the vogue for Harlem, Prohibition and the first successful all-black Broadway show in over a decade. In 1921, Shuffle Along became the surprise hit of the season. The score was by Uwe Blake and Noble Sissel, and the production featured some of the hottest dancing white theater goers had ever seen. It started a vogue for black shows that lasted throughout the decade. After weeks of preparation, the show is ready for the public, and Broadway moves to Harlem for the gala opening night. Prohibition brought the white bootleggers and gangsters uptown. The Cotton Club and Connie's Inn instituted a whites-only policy for the clientele. Small's Paradise had a big floor show and advertised itself as the place where the races mix and the hi-hats mingle with the native stepper. The Lion played the clubs that catered to black clients, like Leroy's, The Nest, and Pods and Jerry's, and the after-hours joints, where the serious musicians put each other to the test, and the younger players came to learn the new sounds of jazz. Pat was a big old good-natured boy born under the sign Gemini. When I worked in Leroy's, James P. Johnson brought him down one Sunday afternoon, and we all dressed in full dress suits and tuxedos. And in comes this guy with a greasy suit on, walks right down to the bandstand and says, Hello there, Lion, what do you say? He made me furious. I turned around and said to Jimmy, Sit that guy down. He looks filthy. And from that day on, I named him Filthy. So he sat down until I got finished. And when I got finished, he was very insistent and very persistent. He insisted that he wanted to play Jimmy Johnson's Carolina Shout. And when I got through, Leonard, he sat down and played the Carolina Shout, made Jimmy like it, and made me like it. And from that on, it was Thomas Pasquale. Most every um, pianist who came along who uh, thought he was playing like Fats Waller, uh, in many cases, picked up things from Fats, that pa Fats picked up from Willie the Lion Smith. And I mean, with the octaves in the bass and doing uh, uh, a certain kind of uh, 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 tenth with a fifth in it, and there are just little, little things that he did uh, that uh, made me think, well, Willie the Lion. When he heard Fats play, the lion said to James P., Watch out, Jimmy, he's got it. They were the three musketeers of Harlem Stride, the lion, James P., and Fats, the big three. When Duke Ellington come to smoke me off, the first time I had a band at the Capitol Palace, 139th Street, Lenox Avenue. I sat him down to play the piano at the Capitol. But I took one look at the guy, and I said, there's a guy that'd make a good band leader. He's sharp, he's got a nice disposition, and he's the type of a guy that wins you over when you first see him. When 
lion was a myth. Actually, that you saw come alive. The lion was one of the greatest influences on uh, the piano players of that era. And when you get to New York and you meet the lion, and the lion, of course, is working in a place called the Capitol Palace, the great thing that impressed me was that the minute you walk into the door, everything is in tempo with the lion. Everything. As Duke related, the whole, the whole place was in step with the lion and the way he was playing. According to Ellington, the walls and furniture seemed to lean understandingly. The waiters served in that tempo. Everybody who had to walk in, out, or around the place walked with a beat. So those were the days when I used to see Ellington walk out and rehearse, rehearse a band all afternoon, don't sleep the next night. Yeah. And I used to take him around in the morning. We used to have pig's feet then. Willie the Lion was the foundation. To spend an evening with the lion was really something of an experience. If you troubled to hang around a while and listen to all that was said and played, you'd learn something. They called them chitlin struts, gumbo suppers, and fish fries. Duke Ellington called them parlor social. So they would run these affairs and they would hire a pianist to play. And the fee was $10 and all you could eat. Besides the home cooking and bootleg booze, the Harlem Rent Party was also a musical battleground, the site of the legendary cutting or carving contests involving the big three and their colleagues. If you had a couple of buddies you wanted to bring along to play, they would split up to 10, or they would play so that the next session would be mine, and the next would be Jimmy's, and the next would be Fats. Willie and James P. had a kind of a routine where James P. would deliberately play a, a wrong note. And Willie would walk out from the other room into the parlor and tap Jimmy on the left shoulder and say, what's the matter, you a cripple? Let me show you how it goes there. Bum, 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 bum. And make like he was stealing the show. Buster was the kind of challenge piece that those fellows used to uh, beat the competition. There was another one with a very similar title, The Finger Breaker, that Jelly Roll Morton used. But this one is clearly uh, throwing down the gauntlet so that uh, no, uh, no amateurs would dare to compete with the mighty lion as he strode into a, a place. Sometimes a cutting contest would occur in, at rent parties. Other times, uh, the cutting contest would occur when uh, some new musician came to town. And the stride pianists were famous for cutting contests. Cutting meant being able to play longer and more varied and with more uh, technical dexterity and in many keys, and also with inventiveness. Chicago, I think. He was famous already because he had uh, done these wonderful uh, uh, Jelly Roll Morton and Red Hot Pepper recordings for Victor. Well, I knew Jelly Roll well. I think I'm one of the few people who did know him, and he was a character, quite a talker. He had a habit of tearing people apart. Well, Jelly Roll Morton had a, a novel piece called Finger Breaker where he would try to outdo the other pianists. And in New Orleans and in Chicago, it was generally known that he cut people. But when he came to New York, the New York pianists uh, really intimidated him, and Willie did. Of course, I challenged him in the Hoofers Club, the Rhythm Club. I got him before nearly 300 musicians, and I said, you call the turns or I'll call them on the piano, and I'm going to make you remember piano as long as you live, and I could. After that, whenever anybody mentioned Jelly Roll Morton, the line would say, oh, you mean Mr. One Hand. Harlem 
was a great place back then. I was up there every night almost. We'd go from the Savoy to Cotton Club to Connie's to Small and Paradise. All these joints. And then these little clubs. All right in a little cluster around Pots and Jerry's. It was a world, a little world of its own. It was the only place you could go to play any kind of music you cared about. A 1930 guide to dining in New York described an evening at a basement club in Harlem called the Catagonia Club, known to regulars as Pods and Jerry's. At Pods and Jerry's, the waffles and bacon are grand, the clientele colorful. There was also a grand piano soloist, one Bill Smith, Harlem's only genuine colored Jew who cheerfully speaks a fluent Yiddish on no provocation whatever. Anybody with a dime used to come up uptown to 131st Street. Bob's and Jerry's is where I had six singing waiters. They used to take a, a tray full of drinks in this hand and dance down the floor. I felt good I'd go in at 11 and stay till 9 in the morning. I had special guests coming out after the shows closed downtown. Okay. At Pods and Jerry's, white musicians and songwriters dropped in after hours to hear the lion holding forth at the Ivories. Big Spiderbeck, the Dorsey Brothers, Hoagie Carmichael, and an unemployed 19-year-old named Artie Shaw. He was a very, very interesting guy to play with. I'd never seen anything like it, never heard anything like it. First time I heard him play, it really threw me. But I got with it pretty soon. I found it was very exhilarating, very, very exciting. Don't forget, he was playing for black audiences, too. And they would put up with much more than whites because they had better, sharper ears. It was up to then, it was more or less their music. Jazz was their music. It wasn't ours. There was no room among whites for that. Whites had no patience for that kind of music. We played jazz, I'd look at you and say, what are you doing? Where's the melody? He was the first guy that paid me any attention. And then later, when he'd say, you know, Artie, my boy, my boy, my boy, I didn't know I was his boy, I was just playing, he was playing. He wasn't arrogant at all, he was really a very sweet guy. But he'd look, play something, he'd look at you like that, like, you know, catch that man, you know. That's what they thought of, called, part of what they thought of his arrogance. It wasn't arrogance, it was kind of funny forthrightness. This is not egotism. But if you can't sell yourself, you don't have faith in yourself. No, nobody in that audience is going to have faith in you. You got to walk out and command the thing. He wasn't above telling you, I'm, I'm the best guy around. I, mean, I can do things other, other people can't do. And he was right. I mean, but people just didn't want people to do that. You know? <laughs> and behind even his most outrageous claims to virtuosity, there was usually a more significant point about the difference between those who sit at the keyboard simply to play and those who invent. I rewrote the Polonaise. Chopin. We have obligations plus complications that haunt me all the day through. You know, man, I can't concentrate one half the time. Why? Because I've got music on my mind. I don't know how he got published. I used to tell him that there are certain things he'd play, like that Echo of the Spring, which has been published. I'd say, Willie, can't you get that on paper? He said, yeah, I got it on paper, but nobody listened. Couldn't get publishers. Well, there, stop and think about it. There was a market for that. Who could play those left hand versus the right hand? Three and four all the time. Who could do that? So most white people wanted to hear when Francis dances with me, Ali G. That's what they wanted to hear. According to the Lion, the only ones who'd published colored composers' work were W.C. Handy and Clarence Williams, who dominated the blues and race record industry in the 1920s. Williams published a folio of compositions by James P. and the Lion, but their music was too hard for the average player and didn't sell. In the 1930s, when pop tunes played by big bands ruled the airwaves, Willie the Lion composed his greatest music. He played some very nice, what we used to call tasty things, that nice feel. They weren't like anybody else. His music that he wrote was very different. Big Spider Bet wrote a thing called In a Mist. I had the same dream. I wrote one called Morning Air. While my Jane was sitting in the park, this is the idea I got. Different phrases, different types. <laughs>
much more harmonically adventurous than some of his uh, colleagues. Uh, there were others who did things like that, but he had his own way. He was, uh, he loved melody, and he was uh, always conscious of playing little melodies with his left hand and doing things that uh, sort of tied the music together in a way that uh, was very personal. He really loved to uh, play something, a chord, that would, for, at first hearing, he said, what? what is it? Oh, well, yeah, that's all right, because he would resolve it. But he'd, he'd catch your ear. Those kind of colors were orchestral colors. And in Ellington's work, you hear this uh, time and time again. Contrary motion. He loved Ravel and Debussy, and he combined these classical influences into his own compositions with stride, and it was sort of made out of whole cloth. So in a sense, he created a new style uh, that was different than the other pianists who loved classical music. His music was like his playing. It was either super duper stride, double tempo, faster than Bud Powell, faster than Charlie Parker at 800 miles an hour, or these beautiful little etude-like numbers like concentrated. In one particular piece called Concentrated, he starts off with a real salon sort of pretty phrase, but the next thing he comes up with is out and out stride, and that goes. But he returns to, and it's these, it, it seems to me that it's these two elements in his musical personality that give much of his character. My mother said he was schizoid. I don't know, I'm no doctor. Willie the Lion uh, thought of himself as uh, a composer who played the piano and uh, was very disappointed, I'm sure, in not getting uh, uh, wider uh, uh, circulation of his compositions. If you look in the uh, various cultures around the world, and you observe how music is taught. More often than not, uh, it's taught mentor to pupil. Uh, in Brazil, if I was a uh, kid growing up in Brazil, I would not be allowed to touch the drums uh, until I learned to sing those rhythms to the uh, satisfaction of whoever my mentor was. Uh, that same kind of mentor-pupil relationship uh, happened in jazz in the early days. Billy Taylor was a teenager taken with the swing piano style of Teddy Wilson when he first came to New York. He immediately headed uptown to a bar managed by a friend of his father's, and from there was invited to a brownstone around the corner to show off his stuff. So I start to play, and I'm walking tense and, and, and doing what I thought was pretty hip for a young piano player. And uh, I was about 16 bars into the tune when this uh, elderly gentleman with a cigar and a and a, a derby came over and said, let me try a little of that, son. I looked at him, yeah, sure. So I get up, and this guy said, I had never in my life heard a left hand like this. The, the left hand, he was playing octaves and, and, and a chord, and he played tenth and a chord. He was doing. I said, wow, you know, I, 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 my mouth fell open. And it was Willie Lyon Smith. The house was belong, belonged to James P. Johnson. Uh, Willie Lyon Smith was there, who was, they were very good friends. There was one young guy who was uh, about my age, I figured, you know, and he was indeed. His name was Thelonious Monk. Willie had uh, Monk, after he had shown me up pretty well, I mean, just to, to show that he didn't have any gener uh, generation bias, he said, uh, Monk, come on over here and play something. Well, Thelonious Monk in those days was trying to play like Art Tatum, so he was kind of running up and down like I was. Willie stopped him. He said, I told you, play your thing. Don't play Tatum. We've got a Tatum already. This was my introduction to Willie the Lion Smith, first uh, as a formidable pianist and, and second as a mentor. With the repeal of Prohibition and the deepening of the Great Depression, many of the Harlem night spots closed. The jazz action moved downtown to 52nd Street. In 1930, the Lion began working a 52nd Street joint called Hellbox, 
which soon moved across the street and reopened as the Onyx Club. The block of 52nd Street between 5th and 6th Avenue uh, was, uh, there were 10 clubs on either side of the, the street and uh, uh, various styles. All of the styles, by the time I got there, uh, all of the styles that were his historically relevant were represented there. So uh, if you started at 6th Avenue and worked backwards, you were going back historically. Down at the far end, closer to 5th Avenue, you had a club uh, where uh, most of the people who played in Willie's style uh, uh, played. But what exactly was Willie's style? On 52nd Street, jazz bands like Eddie Condon's dish out for Hep Cats, the genuine tailgate and gut bucket. The line had been typecast as an old timer playing mainstream or hot jazz. The new generation played it cool. When the first bebop band started ruffling the fur coats of 52nd Street, there was a sudden revival of interest in traditional New Orleans jazz. The lion's age and colorful personality seemed to fit the nostalgic stereotypes, but his originality as a composer and performer made him impossible to label. Willie, because he didn't have many uh, hit songs and was sort of uh, ignored when Bop came along, uh, didn't have many gigs, but he was very proud. You wouldn't know that sometimes he was broke and he wouldn't eat for a day or two. So the first time I met him, he asked me to, uh, I said, what can I bring you? He said, bring me some ravioli. So I brought him a can of ravioli and uh, he immediately heated it up, ate it, and when he was finished, he gave me this very sheepish look like a kid would who put his hand in the cookie jar. And he took the can of ravioli and the brown paper bag and heaved it with one hand out the, uh, out the window to the air shaft. On wild sprees with Fat Swallow and Jimmy, myself, and different fellows like Jack T. Garden, George Wetling. One morning I came home about 9.30, and I had been having a good time, and I was groggy. So I start playing the piano and fooling around, and I got a weird strain in the bass. And I looked around again, and I played it over and over again, and I got another strain. Being half high, I called it zigzag. And I think one reason why his recollections of dates are inconsistent is because of the liquor. Willie the Lion had been a heavy drinker since his newer days, claiming that the booze helped to pace him through the long nights. By the 1940s, the long nights and drinking sprees were taking their toll. Fats Waller died of pneumonia on a transcontinental train. In 1951, James P. Johnson had a massive stroke from which he never fully recovered. At his bedside, the lion played Carolina Shout, and Johnson wrote out a message. They were too good to the piano players with all that free booze. It catches up with you. The lion's legs started giving out, and he was diagnosed with high blood pressure. He had these shoes long from Tom McCann and he fell asleep on the train because he was being juiced and some cat stole his shoes and he was mortified. He was holding his eyeglasses, the earpiece with one hand saying, I'm high, baby, I'm high. You know what, I gotta, I gotta cool it, I gotta cool it. And he did. He was able to cool it with the help of Mary Jane Williams, whom he met in 1949. The lion had finally found his lioness and she became his lifelong companion. And now here he comes down the road. A piece. Well, out of the Willie the man. Smith! Willie! During the 40s and 50s, Smith recorded only occasionally, but he basked in the glow of nightclub work. The fierce keyboard gladiator became a jazz patriarch, a mentor to dozens of young players. It was clear that I was going to become his pupil. He said to my mother, he put his arm around me and he said, Edith, I want you to know that I'm going to take your boy in hand and I'm going to be strict but affectionate with him. Willie had no progeny, so as far as we know, so he, he wanted to pass on and impart what he knew to us. When I was 13, I saw in the New Yorker magazine that they mentioned Willie the Lion Smith one of the remaining stride pianists playing at a place called the Central Plaza. 
Willie the Lion was a regular at the weekend jam fests, along with his drinking buddies Pee Wee Russell, George Wetling, and Jimmy McPartland. There was dancing of all kinds, and the liquor was cheap. Anyway, so my father took me there, and of course I'm anticipating, what is this going to be like? It's like a whole new world opening up. And there was this lousy piano on a stand, and there were these great musicians standing there playing. And I just walked up, and I asked, uh, Willie, I said, my name is Mike Lipskin, and I want to hear you. Do you mind if I stand close to the piano? No problem. As the lion recalled it, the Central Plaza jams gradually evolved into a Dixieland drinking party for young white squares who cared little for real jazz. The musicians who worked the plaza called themselves the Foreign Legion, and the Saints Go Marching In was their marching song. From the opening note at 9 p.m., the audience would start hollering, when are we going to hear the saints? By midnight, the tension was really built up. At about the fifth chorus, the horn men would start leading the parade off the stand and around the hall. Everybody was screaming, wriggling, and throwing glasses. The lion was usually frustrated. The only time you could hear the piano was early in the evening before the ruckus got underway. You had to fight your way in and way out. Sometimes Willie could be very angry, and he could be angry for several hours. He, in certain regards, he didn't receive the respect that he thought he was due because Bop was taking over. And many people would ask, uh, ask him to play uh, compositions or, or songs that he considered to be Uncle Tom or Beneath Him, My Old Kentucky Home or some, man, we don't do that stuff around here. That's corny and that's offensive, you know. Uh, and also, he wasn't successful, he was broke. And when you're broke and you're passed by as an artist and you think you're really talented, many artists become uh, angry. It's a, it's a substitute for depression. The Lion was one of the lucky ones who got called to be in this historic photo that um, ran in Esquire in January of 1959. The picture was taken in the summer of 58 and it has since become known as the greatest jazz photo. Well, it certainly is the greatest collection of jazz people ever photographed. And among the stars was Willie Smith, which was very important because this picture, as it turns out, represents many layers of jazz, of early jazz New Orleans, um, right up to uh, Sonny Rollins and uh, Dizzy and Thelonious Monk. So it was a nice bouquet of people and they all got along wonderfully well. And of course, the lion is so stately and proud that everybody was deferring to him. And he chose to stand next to his buddy, Lucky Roberts. They look like Mutt and Jeff because uh, Lucky is a little short guy and the lion was stood tall and proud. It was a hot August morning and the photo took so long to set up that Willie, who suffered in the heat, left Lucky Roberts and sat down on a nearby stoop. Meanwhile, Art Kane kept clicking his picture, and the one they chose to put in the magazine is the one where he's missing. Now Willie the Lion missed out on the most important jazz photo that ever was, and heaven knows he was an important figure and should have been in it. But the Lion, of course, is so self-important, he had to walk out and get his own throne over there. He's sitting, I think, a couple of steps up. As long as they can wheel me up to the piano with the help of the good Lord, I'm going to play. During the late 1960s, when various kinds of pre-bop jazz were once again popular, Willie the Lion Smith became a frequent guest on television and at jazz festivals around the world. In 1969, the White House hosted Duke Ellington's 70th birthday party, and Ellington invited his old mentor. They remained very close for their entire life. Whenever Duke was in town and had time, he'd always make sure that Willie was included in all his parties or events. For Ellington, the high point of the evening was seeing the Lion of the Concert Grand with his derby on playing behind the president. Willie the Lion Smith kept right on performing and teaching until his death from cancer in April 1973. While the works of his peers, James P. Johnson, Fats Waller, Jelly Roll Morton, and Yubi Blake, have enjoyed frequent recordings and reinterpretations, Willie the Lion's music has been curiously overlooked. Two of his students suggest some reasons why. 
inimitable. Uh, nobody plays like that today. I think it's I think it's too difficult for the average pianist. That's why nobody touches it. I've never heard anybody play it as well as he did. Well, he didn't play what we call today's kind of jazz, which is like uh, what makes Ted Williams a better baseball player than somebody else. They are freaky. They're different. be in his apartment uh, and he'd say yeah, out of nothing he'd say you know why uh, water disappears from a vase I'd say why and he would say because the angels come and drink it and I said don't you mean evaporation he'd say yeah that's it <laughs> For more about the life and music of Willie the Lion Smith, including interview transcripts, historical background, musical analysis, and a teacher's guide, log on to www.njn.net. Funding for Willie the Lion has been provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting through the Eastern Educational Network Program Fund, the New Jersey Performing Arts Center, and the New Jersey State Council on the Arts, a partner agency of the National Endowment for the Arts.